Hi, and welcome to Yeshiva Shem Ever, Rabbi David Katz. And you are listening to the Parsha of the Week. We are on Parshas Vayetze. Questions, comments, or feedback, I can be reached at Rabbi Katz at virtualyeshiva.com. And as always, we're going to start with an introduction of the Haftorah. This week it's very mild. Pardon me, Joe, pardon me. <laughs> Why it came out so mild, I don't know. Um, imagine if you dig around deep enough, you'll find something. But uh, nothing quite jumped off the page, except only, only uh, the entire premise was there. So it wasn't exactly quantity, but the quality was there. Zohar was interesting. We'll get into that. And then we will launch into the Parsha. Was everybody able to see the article? The article posted? Yeah? Okay. All right, let's go. Basically, to get things uh, going here, the Haftorah makes three words in the book of Hosea that will summarize the entire class, everything that we're going on about. So I'll say the three words and we can all go home. I remember when we were in high school and the teacher was uh, late for class, we thought, okay, the teacher has a call, we all get to go home. <laughs> this is one of those moments, only we're staying. Yaakov Sadeh Aram. Jacob was in the field of Aram. Now, everybody put on your, your Shem thinking cap. Remember we were when uh, Ross, you were there uh, when we talked about Shem two years ago, and the various and numerous yeshivas of Shem. There, however many there were, we kept finding more and more. Well, this parsha is the source of, of of the large extent of those yeshivas. You guys remember that? remember those classes, the first seven I think uh, classes of the Shem series. So we, we have in Aram is one of the yeshivas of Shem, and they and my I have you know 50, 50 trillion books on disc. I lie, it's actually fifty thousand, but I call it fifty trillion, right? And I do a when I started teaching Noahides, uh, you know, I, to as if there was going to be a shortage of material. Little did I know, but once upon a time, I believed that we would be short on material teaching Noahides. Pardon me. So I bought the 50,000 books. Anybody interested, it's called Otsar Chachma, and it is fantastic. Uh, I don't work for them, but I certainly have no problem plugging them. And, I, you know, I would sit down in the very early days, and I would search Shem, Ben Noach, or Malki Tzedek, and, you know, a good 1,500 hits would come up. And I'm saying, okay, I can teach Noahides for at least 1,500 weeks before I run out of material. That was my headspace, letting, letting the, the old secrets out of the bag. Nowadays, thank God, there's no shortage of material. Uh, we all, well, that's quite apparent, I'm sure, by now. And the, what, one of the first things that I found, which still is you know, one of the basic pillars of what I teach, of what I've found, you know, there are numerous yeshivas of Shem and Aver. Now, I live in Sfat, and Joe, you were in the cave of Shem and Aver, right? Across the street from my house is the original study hall of Shem and Aver where Jacob studied. I used to pray uh, in, the in the synagogue more often. I used to go to Kiddush in the cave, and a lot of this revelation came down in that cave. No joke. I was there. Joe, you were there, and you saw there's definitely something to this. And so everybody in Sfat knows that Shem and Aver have their cave in Sfat. Jacob was here, and that's the end of the story. Only when you do a search in 50 trillion books, you find out that Shem had academies, at least in Aram. And this is what the, the Haftorah is going on about. Jacob went to the field of Aram. Now, who else is in Aram? Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Jacob, probably Lovin also. Shem had the influence over there, and to this day, now, this might be have changed, 
because I believe that the um, Syrian civil war may have destroyed the yeshiva. I heard that's why I, 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 I'm the area I know was hit, but I don't know if they actually killed the remnant of the shul. But they say that there's a remnant of the yeshiva over there, or at least a known spot. And the Haftorah is saying that Jacob went to the field of Aram. Now, the field is really, if we're, if, if we're going to judge these three words, what we really want is field. Asaph was a man of the field. And we're going to dis dissect a little bit more today what that meant. We did it last week and told us, although the, the, the focus was more on Shem. And you know what does it mean that Jacob now takes on the field? For all intents and purposes, Asaf was the man of the field. Jacob is the man of the tent. Tent, Torah, field, prayer. Jacob becomes the man not only of Torah, but the master of prayer. That's the Torah. Now, there's a lot more there, but what really, those three words, Jacob, the man of the field of Aram, that's what this is about. That really hits the essence of the, what, we're, what we're going on about. Now, before we get into the crux of the article uh, and, and exploring more of those yeshivas of Shem and Aver, let's go quickly to the Zohar. The Zohar had a fantastic learning. It took me all day to get this. You know, there's a lot of times when I'm, when I'm reading on Shabbat, um, you know, I I, I I might go eighty pages and not know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and and I, but I'll, eventually I'll kind of snap out of it and say, wait wait a second, what do you, what in the world did you just do? You know, you didn't get a word of what you're saying. You're just reading it, and I went back towards the end of Shabbos and I got it. Like you, you, sometimes you have to read, just read without understanding a good fifty plus pages. And get a general, general grasp of what you're what you're going over, and then when you start over, you really hit what's going on because you have, might have to stay focused and, and hold intention over fifty pages. Now this is one of those times, and when I got it, I realized you know how how serious this was. There are five men who changed history with the repair. Of, of what's called Malchus, you know, Hashem's revelation in, in, in this world. And it begins, obviously, with Adam. He, and, and he's tempted or tested with the female attribute. In this case, it's Eve and the snake. Adam's job is to, is to attain the, the level of wisdom called Chaya, life, life, life force or livelihood by by attaining that level of masculine wisdom he will release or attain or incorporate woman the you know the feminine traits in him i.e understanding or being a he becomes a complete man absolutely complete man if he succeeds he doesn't but the zohar says not don't fret over adam's plight it's part of a process that Adam eats the tree of knowledge of good and evil, has the thing with Eve and the snake, and he's tested and comes out of the repair of the feminine attribute, the revelation, Malchus, our world, which is the, the, the arena of all repair and revelation from God. Adam starts it. Noah, same thing, enters the arena, he gets drunk. No, now it's not eating in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He gets drunk, reveals himself over the feminine attributes, and a little better, but not fixed, but not for not. It's a process. Enter Abraham. Now the 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 well is is is, is pulling water, and he's dealing with Sarah, the female agency here. But he he goes down to Egypt and in danger. But he comes up from danger. So forth Isaac until Jacob, it is repaired. By Jacob we have a repair that the Malchus, the revelation, our world, again, the, 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 our reality is now prime 
for a Sinai experience. Jacob, who is the forefather, let's say, of Israel, Israel being the four houses of Israel, Cohen, Levi, Israel, Ger, you can say he's the forefather of the Jews. You can say he's probably the most righteous Ger that ever lived. According to the Ramban commentary, he really has that level still of Ger, but he's keeping most of the, of the of everything. We say that Avos, the forefathers, kept the whole Torah, and the Ramban goes into how Jacob can give certain offerings that only a Jew can give and keep Shabbat. So Jacob is, is your real sublime Ger Tzedek, you know, that he who keeps everything. And that's why he, he attains the, the title Israel, wrestles the angel, wins over the blessings from, from Asav, and he really is carrying the mission of both Asav and Jacob in the new, uh, newly fashioned Israel. So that's Jacob. That, that's the Jacob Rachel story. And Jacob succeeds in understanding uh, the principle of understanding. He becomes the counterpart to the Shekinah of the Divine Presence. Okay. Uh, side issue. This is interesting. Um, I think this is probably a pretty common and, and, and basic understanding or idea, but the Zohar explains it in detail, how the Sfirot uh, parallel the tribes. Ten Sfirot, twelve tribes, with Dot and Atik, the uh, two additions to the spheres, you can find how the, the tribes parallel the Sfirot. And what the Zohar says explicitly is that uh, Yisachar Zvulin, or Netzach and Hod, Yosef Yisod, this is, this is, I'm going to say this quickly because I don't want to explain it, but just for, and again, there's no point in explaining it. These are like the Sukkot Knights. We say the first night's Abraham, second night's Isaac. It's one of those uh, labels that to look into deeper is a different endeavor. But Yisachar Zvulin, Netzach and Hod, Yosef Yisod, Yehuda Malchus, Chesed, Gevora, Teferis is Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. Joe, I figure you'd like that. There you go. Have, have fun chewing on that one. Now, this one is really interesting. This I found myself. This is very interesting. The, 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 the book, or say for Kol Hator, the voice of the turtle dove, which is a Shulchan Arach, or guide of the redemption, based on a verse in, in Song of Songs. The Vilna Gaon wrote it. It's the basic idea, original idea of Zionism. The Vilna Gaon is the father of Zionism, modern Zionism. Based on the premise that he lived in the paradigm clock at 6 a.m. or the year 5500 in the Jewish year, 1740 in the secular year. It was prophesied by Daniel, alongside the Baal Shem Tov and the Ramchal. And the whole book is based on gematria. It's a, it's a system in the Zohar called Maisa V'Cheshben. That every concept has a number through gematria. We can understand the will of God through a, a, a series of checks and balances, which incorporates the, the, the Torah of Aver, as in Shem and Aver that we're going to get into, i.e. the mazal and wisdom of one's name. So therefore, in Kula Tor, it's a book of Gematria, essentially, that it shows the inner workings of the Torah. And one of the most famous Gematrias used is 741. That is the Gematria Mashiach ben Ephraim. It's also the Gematria Mashiach ben David, in opposite letters called Atbash, where like the Dalad becomes a Kuf, the Aleph becomes a Taf, Base becomes a shin. Look it up. Every letter has an opposite. 22 letters. Aleph, Tav, Beit, Shin, Gimel, Resh, Dalad, Kuf, so forth and so on. So 741 being this, this integral number for both Yosef and Yehuda, Mashiach and Ephraim, Mashiach and David. Get this. The Zohar talks about Kruvim. The, the angelic level of soul of, of some people that are in Silas, I would say Jews, but generally it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Joseph, David also being one. So it, it's, it's the Atsilas or upper body Neshamas. And two of them are Joseph and Benjamin. 
Now, it's 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 a level of soul that's really, let's just, for lack of better terms in English, let's just call it special. An extremely special and uh, Torah-worthy soul. You know, the, the souls of the Torah, the stars of the Torah are really these kinds of souls. Again, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Shem, Adam. The Gematria Yosef is the same as the Gematria Benjamin, Benjamin Joseph. When Joseph is filled with the letter He, 161, Benjamin, 162, and in the laws of Gematria, you can always be off by one, as Reuven and Shimon are, are one off from, I believe, Ephraim and Manasseh, if I'm not mistaken. Thus, when we compute Yosef Hatzadik and Benjamin Hatzadik, you come to the Gematria, no joke, this is a really good one, 741, right on the money, which is the same Gematria that when Solomon, King Solomon has the kingdom ripped away from him, it says, Ikra, Ikra, I will surely tear away from you. 741, Yehuda, Judah, be, you know, turning away from his brothers with the not with the, the Canaanite wife, he turned away as the same Gematria, 741. And finally, as I was talking to Chaim tonight, Michael Rusa, with all this Judah and Joseph action, what about the tribe of Levi? You know, the inner the intermediary here. We know that Pinchas married the daughter of Joshua. Joshua was the last revelation of Sheep and Ephraim. Pinchas inherits from Joshua in what's called Givat Pinchas Beno, the hill of Pinchas, the son of uh, his father, Eleazar. And encoded there is the transfer of Mashiach Ben Yosef to the Pinchas' lineage as brought by the Arizal and the Gematria Givat hill of Pinchas, his son, again, 741. And last but not least, as Chaim mentioned, do you have any other Levi in there? And we do. Shiloh. I'm sure we're, many of you are familiar with the verse in Vayachi, Jacob's blessings to the tribes. It says, Ad ki avo Shiloh. And the blessings to Judah, he says, when, Ju when, when Shiloh shall arrive, until then the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Shiloh is the Gematria. Moshe, they say that Shiloh is a, a, a name of Mashiach in the, in the Talmud Sanhedrin. And this is a proof that Moses is Messiah. Now, the, the, it's called Nishmat Moshe. The soul of Moses is actually a major portion of the soul of Messiah. Thus, you have Moshe, the same Gematria as Shiloh. They're synonymous. When you take the Gematria, Mo, Moshe Halevi Shiloh. As in, Shiloh is ha Moshe Halevi. Moses the Levite. The Gematria, you guessed it, 741. Um, why this 741? I don't know. Uh, it's just one of the famous Gematrias. We actually pray that Mashiach and Yosef doesn't die in the Amida prayer. And we have intention of the name Mashiach and Yosef, where it says that we will raise the horn of David. We have intention of Mashiach and Ephraim with the number 741. It's, it just happens to be that that is a very powerful special number. All right, there's your introduction. We've done the Haftorah with the Zohar a little bit different this week, right? The Haftorah was more to the point. The Zohar was a little bit more mechanical in gematrias and numbers. And onwards into the article. We start vague and ambiguous. The Balatorium, the commentary on the Torah, explains that the opening passage where Jacob went out from Beersheba there's, if you take either two, two of the words or three of the words in the beginning and end letters gives you the name Aver and Shem. And he's telling you that Jacob spent time in the houses of study of Aver and Shem and they are not the same. There's a study hall of Aver. There's a study hall of Shem. Shem, we know, he has the Torah, the Torah of Shem. He, he'll introduce the Torah to the world after the flood. We know all about Shem. Where do we find any greatness of Aver, the grandson of Shem? Other than the fact that Abraham is identified 
as Avraham Ivri, Abraham the, the Averite, who had, was inspired by Aver. Aver comes from the language Ivrit, as in Hebrew. Names are given through the power of Ivrit, or the Torah of Aver. Abraham's name is a product of superior Hebrew, containing a name of God with the word of creation, Barama. Abraham's son has a Hebrew name of, ex of excellent meaning, Isaac. Abraham then is the master of the Hebrew language, evidenced by the book of creation, say for Yitzhira. Interestingly, when Abraham sends the sons of Keturah to the original land, it says he sent them with names of impurity, meaning he did not give them the Torah of Aver in their names, as to make separate sons of Abraham in the world. There are those of Israel, there are those the land of Israel, that is, and those out of the land of Israel. Now, interestingly enough, every name has this Aver principle. It says, is it in Hebrew or not? Or is it, you know, literally in a, in a direct course with Hebrew? Abraham disguised it to make, to make a distinction amongst his sons. But what Aver is doing in his, in his son Peleg says that the world, there was a prophecy that the world would separate and split after the flood. He names his son Peleg to produce such a concept. And it happens. Once it happens, the Midrash is on record for saying, not a, not a prophet is Aver, but a great prophet. That we, we see that great prophecy was the yeshivas of, of Shem and Aver, the schools of prophecies that will one day in the future be Elisha and Elijah, carrying the tradition of prophecy in meditation of the world. But more importantly, the names that we are given contain the wisdom, mazal, and prophecy from our parents given over to us. Aver is that revelation. He is that, that wisdom and the mazal to understand and decode names. Once you understand decoding names, everything becomes a name. Every emanation becomes a name. We can begin to perceive Hashem in our world. These are the schools and academies of Shem and Aver. We've mentioned them now in Beersheba. We've mentioned them in Jerusalem, Sfat, Aram, Garden of Eden. There are several spots around the world, if not throughout the entire world, where Shem and Aver set up institutions of study. Now we're going to go into the Parsha and see the existential change in the Torah. The Torah begins with creation, redemption, Garden of Eden, Abraham, Isaac, the forefathers, establishment of the Ger, Torah, pre-Torah, Noah's Ark, the animals. We have everything there. And it was very interesting. Even in Toldus, it's it's where you know it's a nice family, a nice story. Cute little Jacob steals the birthright. But we have an existential change in our Parsha. People grow up. The Torah grows up. It's no longer seeing Jacob as that little boy we saw. And we all saw him as that little boy. And because that was the theme of the Torah, we, we kind of saw Abraham in a, in a mythological perspective. Something kind of like a, a fantastic story. Jewish mythology, you know, Shem in the boat, a cute uh, children's present to buy, a Noah's Ark picture, Adam and Eve with the, the evil serpent. Now, these are serious stories, don't get me wrong. But we take them as stories. Not many, Unfortunately, not many people put stock in Bereshis with Adam and Eve as the world repair, as a tremendous philosophical existential work. Noah's Ark is the basis of all redemption and exile. He's just a, 
a cute story that we have to just get through until we get to Abraham. Shem is non-existent. Abraham is something that, that, that we, we know not of. He's the perfect Jew, but we're not, we never get into Abraham Gervatoshav Anochi. We go into Isaac, and he's that he's this cute kid jesting with with Ishmael. He's 37 on the Akeda. We think he's like 10. If we knew this openly the secrets of Isaac, things would change. Isaac in the Talmud is considered the father of Israel. He's praying in the field at the temple uh, of the temple's future destined site. These are these are stories of greatness, and we treat them as eh, they're cute little anecdotes. The yeshiva world barely touches them. They want law and doctrine and halacha, which is fine. But there are tremendous, tremendous insights in the opening passages of Bereshis. And as much as we can, we can put everybody under the bus or sweep them under the rug and say, you know, we're not on the level to understand Isaac and Abraham and Shem and Noah and Adam and Eve and creation, which I don't buy that. But that's what people say. And they don't invest time and interest in working out those equations. When you get to Jacob, it's a little bit different. All of a sudden, Jacob and Lovin or Laban is not just a cute story. Even with the switching of the wives of, of Rachel and Leah, it's really not a cute little story. And what's with the he goats and the rods and, and the speckled and the striped and the colored? What is that? And the tribes? Who are what are tribes? And what's with the names? Names we never really feel comfortable with. And it seems like there's something deep there. It seems like something's going on. And Jacob lost that innocence of youth. He seems a little bit distant because of the depth involved. As much as we went existentially greater in the Parsha, especially when you get into the commentaries that tell you that Jacob just frequented the house of study of Shem and Aver. Who? What do you mean Shem and Aver have yeshiva? You know, there's a lasting memory I have from yeshiva my first year. And we, we, we can all understand what the, the atrocity I'm about to say. Every yeshiva guy in the world sits in this week's Parsha. We read the commentaries and they say, Jacob left and he went to the house of study of Shem and Aver. And every single kid says, what do you mean the Torah of Shem and Aver? And they say the same thing every year. Ah, well, the Torah they had in those days, it was like, like they wrote some stuff down, they had some ideas. It was, you know, a way of, a way of a moral code. We're not even talking the Noahide laws here. We're talking about the Torah of Shem. No, nah, it's a code of how to be nice, how to behave, theoretical behavior. And the most people hear and they say, wow, okay. And then that's it. We moved on. It's never brought up again, ever. You learned it once when you were 20 years old and you are very much unimpressed. And Shem and Noah and Aver, nice try, guys. Uh, next time you, sh you should try to be Jewish. But when you when you when you get tripped up over that, and don't accept the Yiddish word "weiter, weiter, move on, quick, go," sit on this, on this portion. Say, wait a second, Shem and Aver in their Torah. And then you look it up, and like we said, Rashi says, Aver is a great prophet. Shem, was in the Midrash, he was at Sinai for you know over a thousand years through the giving of the Torah until he meets up with King Solomon. Shem and Aver, there's a lot going on if you research off the page. Shem actually eats of the tree of, of, of life, says the Midrash. 
So these are not people to just throw out and discard because we, we simply don't see them in the, the actual written text of the Torah. But what we have sticking out like a sore thumb is Yaakov, Jacob. He has lost that innocence of youth. He is not simple. When you plug all these components together, now you start to really get into a different level of Torah. Now, we all like the Hanukkah passages with Joseph and the brothers. It's very engaging and intriguing. But until you get into, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, until you get into Shem and Ever as, as a background of where Jacob learned Torah, where Joseph learned Torah, where Judah learned Torah, where Benjamin learned Torah, as we delve and trek into the Hanukkah season with the brothers and the tribes until the culmination of Genesis, we know there's something going on over there, but we never really appreciate it. There's just too many things that don't add up. Jacob is the self-taught Torah master. And Joseph just also learned from Jacob. It's, it's all one-sided. But when you bring in Shem and Ever through the entire continuum of Bereshis, for behind Abraham was Shem and Ever. Behind Isaac and Jacob were Shem and Ever. They were the backbone of Torah institutions of the world. It was brought to my attention two years ago. You know where we see Shem's Torah bust through? Where in the world does Jacob know how to use rods for breathing he goats? Put the speckled wind in front of him and it, it, it arouses him to come out. I mean, where does he learn this? You must say he learned it from the Academy of Shem and Ever. We know he was there. It's not like we're making up, oh, well, I bet he learned from Shem and Aver. It is documented all over the place. So when we pull the ingredients together, this Parsha really starts to take a turn to godless greatness. The depth becomes no longer an impediment. It becomes a blessing. Thank God. Thank God there's depth here. Now I can understand. And it begins with the Torah of Shem and Ever in the background. As the Marsha commentary in the Baltorum introduced to us that Jacob is, is just now leaving Yeshiva and going to another Yeshiva over in Aram, the field of Aram. He begins to integrate the Ace of program into his psyche. Ace of is not that bad of a guy. Unless you view him in that alternate universe where Jacob is under, misunderstood, Shem and Aver don't exist. Let's call it the only Jewish universe. There's no gear. There's no Din Yisrael for the Gerard Sinai. As in, there's no Shabbat opportunities. Noahides maybe exist in some theoretical dimension. It's just the Jewish people. It's about the doctrines we believe for all of this time. The light to the nations is a feel-good story. And I don't know anything about being a priest to any nations. If you take this point of view, yeah, Esau is a pretty bad guy. He is antithetical to everything that we believe in. But when you open it up to the world of the gear, and you have a 360 degree view, I'm not saying Asif is justified, but he's certainly in proper context. He's an impediment to Jacob. Because Jacob is about the universal message. He's putting out Shem and Aver's universal message that actually is contained. In the Torah of Moses, which when we end the class today, we're going to explain the integration of both. So yeah, for Jacob, Esav is a, is a problem. Esav wants Judaism. 
or let's call it Yiddishkeit. Forget the world. Forget global, you know, global unity. Forget Achdus unity. Forget universal message. Esav is a one-sided character. Jacob is universal. They're going to clash. And it's going to look like a real Russia. But when you look at it, what Esav stood for, it has its context. And it's no different today than the travesty we see in the Jewish world and how it views the, the rapidly growing Noahide world, not out of evil, simply ignorance. I mean, how many things exist in the world that we're probably ignorant of? I'm sure that I should be protesting destroying rainforests in South America. I'm sure. It cannot be a good thing. Now, am I raising a whole ruckus? No. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. I'm sure California might be being pelted with Fukushima reactor from Japan. Okay, I'm not raising a whole ruckus about that either. But from what I see on Facebook and the news, yeah, it's a problem. But mankind has a way of saying, you know, priorities, this and that, you know. My priority is that the Torah should go out to the world. That's what I focus on. What if I'm wrong? What if we should be, you know, taking radiation precautions right now? Point being, Asaph is that ignorant guy. He, he has his prayer. He's in the field. He's trying to impress Yitzchak, Isaac. Forget about Jacob and his grandiose delusions of bringing Torah to the world. And let's say the ultimate message of Torah and what, what Sinai was all about. A Sinai personality. Asa says, Sinai Shemite. And for that, he was actually very religious. He's giving tithes. He's talking to Isaac. He's praying in the field. He's trying to absorb it. But he's missing that Yaakov component. Praying in a field without faith is pretty much irrelevant. As faith is that necessary ingredient. Thus, Asaph loses the birthright because of this. Jacob wins it over by God's divine providence. And all through the Parsha, we see all those attributes, Ace of the man, Ace of the field, pray, standing in the field with prayer, Ace of who tithes, Ace of who cooks delight to show that he has understanding the feminine trait you know, to, to, to cook a Shabbos meal. But it's all one-sided. Jacob incorporates it perfect. Torah receives the prayer, but we saw that he who dwells only in prayer had a very shallow dimension of Torah. Asim is that shallow Torah. Yeah, a story of a guy in a garden, and hey, Abraham, go to Israel. Okay, I guess not so hard. And Isaac digging some wells. That's Asim's Torah. Did it happen? Yeah, it happened. Does it matter? Yeah, it matters, you know. Jacob lives it. Jacob's saying, what if we live this? What if I go in the field and pray and really believe that it gives nourishment? Emona, what if the Torah that you can really live, Shem's Torah of life, and yield results of knowledge, let's say, of the divine will, of commandments, i.e. the Torah of Moses. What if they go together? Is there a meaning to life? Existentialism. Do I matter? Do I mean something? Asim says, eh, we all mean something. Eh, don't worry about it. And that is the, the religious approach today. Don't think. Don't rock the boat. And to the no eye, certainly do not contemplate. Please do not think about anything. Do the seven go to heaven? That's Asif. There's no need to contemplate whether there's a God or not a God. It's irrelevant. I know there's a God, but you don't need to focus on these things. Or as Jacob is saying, just the opposite. Of course you need to focus on these things. What do you think it's about? Why are you tithing if not to focus? In fact, after Jacob has the revelation, he says, I'm tithing to God. And he does. 
He gives Levi to be a Kohen, a priest of God. So you see the different schools here. One is, I say, Erev Rav, a mentality, just superficial Torah, be religious, make a good impression, and be light. Don't dig. Which goes very well at the beginning of the Torah. Most people's approach. By the time you get to Jacob, you must make a choice. If you're going to keep Jacob light, you're doing so by throwing under the bus Shem and Aver, which is a grave error. Grave error. Because they make a penetration in the entire Torah, and they are 100% part of the pill pull, a matter within a matter in the entire Torah. The Torah of life in the Torah. The, the, the essence of Torah on a simple level. You know, all these proverbs of wisdom, of, you know, work hard, try every day, focus, all those life lessons. That's the Torah of Shem that is needed to understand the Torah of Moses. I.e., Asaph saying, throw away Shem and Aver so you won't understand what I, Asaph, am all about. I actually want you to say I'm the Russia, the bad guy. I wanted to kill this one and do that. that, that I'm safe there. Negative attention is sometimes better than no attention. But with the tour of life of Shem and Aver, you say, wow, Esau, that's you? Then we can understand why Jacob really wants that birthright and how the Mashiach ben Yosef program, i.e. the messianic program, Esau's rights are delivered to Jacob. Jacob is that man of the field. When we see Jacob in the Parsha, how many times does he come in from the field? How many times do we see that he's praying at the Temple Mount, at the nighttime prayer? He comes, wakes up in the morning, comes in from night, it field, 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 field. Haftor is talking, Jacob's in the field. Jacob's a man in the field. Jacob grew up. He grew up and he did take that birthright. And again, that's also not lip service. He took it. He uses it. He developed it. And he served Shem 50 years. He becomes a master of names and mazal as Aver's great prophecy depicts. Which brings us to a terrific question. The Talmud Shabbos says, there's no mazal for Israel. And it says, wait a minute, maybe there is mazal for Israel. And everybody asks me, because of the work I do, Rabbi Katz, how can you say there's mazal names when we say Jews don't have mazal? Only the goyim have mazal. And that's not a good thing. That's the astrology, uh, you know, predictions and astro forecasts that go around on Facebook. If you're a Libra, don't leave your house today. It's bad luck. Again, I, I make a joke out of this because I think it's very funny. Um, I was at the bookstore in Sfat, I guess about a year ago. And I, in the used book section, and this is after I've, I've started my work with Mazal, as many people know, and names, Vilnagon, I come across the Encyclopedia of Mazal. No joke. <laughs> Hebrew book. Everything in Torah ever written about Mazel is called the Encyclopedia of Mazel. And I'm saying, what a find! How in the world is a guy like me finding that book? And the first thing it says in the book, you should know that Torah scrolls are bound by Mazel. Meaning all Torah that you will ever learn will come to you by God's divine providence, i.e. Mazel. I must have read that book, I think, in one Shabbos, a thousand pages. It was like a kid in a toy store. Literally, it's like a kid in a toy store. And it covers, what does it mean? No mazel, yes mazel. There's a lot of ways of cutting this up. You can say no mazel. There's no mazel, which means you can, uh, I forget how this goes. It's always, I think you say you cannot change your mazel. Yeah, whatever it is, it is. But when it says yes mazel, ah, yeah, you have Mazel, you can change it. But the definition I like the best, it's a way of saying Jews have no Mazel. They, they believe not in Mazel. So Jews believe, you know, oh, a coincidence happened to me. A 
weird thing happened to me. They refused to admit Mazel because Goyesha Mazel is so Goyesha. Nobody wants to get the Libra astro forecast from some witch doctor in, in, in Tahiti. That, that's ridiculous. So the Jews, when they hear Mazel, they think, you know, the, the, the worshiping the stars, idolatry. So no Mazel for Israel. But at the same time, it says, yes, there is Mazel for Israel. That once you reject the, the, the callous lower Mazel, the upper Mazel, the upper world of Atsilas is very real, very divine, and very given to you by God. That knowledge which comes to you by way of metaphor and analogy, much like King Solomon might write, writes Moshalim, our analogies, God also communicates through dreams, images. Sometimes you get, you get a divine revelation like Moses had in terms of clarity. Meaning sometimes you just know something comes from God. The code of understanding such divinity is the Torah of Shem and Aver. How to understand what your name means. Understanding that names are latent with Mazal. That the, the, when things are strange happening, that actually is God working around us. When you have those magic moments of spontaneity, coincidence, you can, in fact, chalk it up to God. You know, I was in the bookstore in Svat the other day, and an amazing Mazal moment happened. For me, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm educated a little bit about it. I, I can recognize it. I said, yeah, that was that was Mazal. He says, no, I don't believe in Goyesha Mazal. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, you don't understand Jewish spirituality. Or better yet, Torah spirituality. Or better yet, ancient, authentic Torah spirituality. There's a science to these things. You can interact with creation through understanding creation. Look at the first two verses of Mishlei, of Proverbs. Solomon gave an analogies to know wisdom and ways of rectification of oneself to change his actions in order to understand words of understanding. The more you understand the creation talking to you, that's fine-tuning focus with God. Then the codes and imagery becomes clear. The, the Kabbalistic metaphors become a knowledge base. And then the whole world becomes an analogy as you are the center of God's world, Sadak Yasodalam, the righteous who maintains the pillar of the world. The Torah of Moses, on a very surface level, is just stories, laws, archaic, boring. How do we crack this code? How do I get to know who Asaph really is? Then you see people answering, well, he was uh, he was saying this prayer, and then he had this halacha. Okay, in a Jewish world, maybe. Only the reality doesn't work that way, not even amongst the most pious Jews. I mean, people have personalities. They have lives, they have kids, they have wives, husbands, family members. They buy milk from the grocery store. And sometimes when you ask how much the milk cost, sometimes that means just that. How much does the milk cost, Bob? It doesn't have to be a halachic pill pool on how much milk costs. The Torah is a book of life in reality. Sometimes Asaph is a person. Jacob is a person. Granted, they're special people. People of destiny and mazal. The Torah of Shem and Aver allow us the 360 degree radius to say, who are these people in life? Jacob is all infatuated with the number seven. Seven years, seven weeks, seven this. They say, why? So the Zohar answers. Because Jacob is saying, I'm holding by spirituality. I don't want to say one week or one year. Let's go Kabbalistic and make it seven, sanctify God. The Torah of Shem and Aver is the book and code within the Torah of Moses of understanding life. Shem ate of the tree of life and lived, says the Midrash. 
Aver gives the idea of names. Names that if we had sublime knowledge of how to name, you can actually make Kabbalistic effect in the world. If you know how the names really work in the creation, right? Let's say I make a name. Google goes out of business tomorrow. And that's called uh, Bob Jones the Third. It's not. But let's say Bob Jones the Third. Bob means Google. Jones means out of business. And the third means tomorrow. Then you can bring Google out of business tomorrow. And that is a gross uh, and, uh, d depiction. It's not accurate. What you have is somebody like Pinchas, the Cohen. His name, his entire mission with the spear and Zimri and Cosby the Zohar says it's in that name. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Betzalel who made the, the, the vessels of the ark in the shade of God. Names mean something. So if you name with intent, real intent, you can affect the world in a major way. Abraham's name is that, Bara Ma. So the names of the Tanakh are, are, are not just names of people. It's Kabbalistic intent to affect the reality. That's Mazal. Now, the, the next question has to become, where do we see this again? In the Parsha with Jacob. Look at the 12 sons. Each one of them, if you saw in the article, it tells a story. Joe wrote it out. Joe wrote out, and I realized when working with Joe, that is the Shekhinah's voice coming through for everyone that read the article. Read it. Because God has seen my humiliation, for now my husband will love me. The God heard that I was unloved. This is the Shekhinah talking through Rachel and Leah. And each time it's a mazel moment. Yehuda, Judah's the fourth son. She's praising God. So what do you do? This is brilliant what she does. There's something called a node. Like a lot of wisdom bound up on one point. Put the dalid between the vav and the hay. It makes the word Yehuda. May he be thanked or praised. But dalid is also number four in Gematria, representing that Judah was the fourth son. So the Mazel moment is, ah, four son, Dalit, praising God. The whole term in birth was predicated on she was praising God. Now, this worked for all 12 sons. Let me give you a very, very clear analogy of how this works. True story about the same. When my wife was pregnant with Zohari, my daughter, it must. Uh, this may. I think this was the night that her water broke. Actually, we were in the house. It was deep into the night, and like I said, the water is going to break in a couple hours. So I didn't know, obviously, what was about to come. And my, my wife was very, very, very fidgety, and my other, my son Reuven was in his bedroom across the hall. He was just uh about a year old at that time. I think he woke up and wanted a bottle or he needed a diaper change, whatever it was, and she would not settle down. Very ultra fidgety. And I'm laying there like a like a, like a rabbi looking at this, analyzing what's going on here. It was it was it was beyond steadfast. And I and I worked it out in my in my in my mind what's going on. I said She's taking care of Reuven, like, over and beyond the call of duty. How could this be? And when I realized, when I narrowed it down, I heard, you know, the famous words of Rachel, or Rebecca, both of them, Shema Mikuli, listen in my voice. That when we speak, we give over what the divine word is doing. And I heard myself saying, she is taking care of her baby. So do you hear do you hear the Shema B'Kali? Why was she doing this? She was in the in the in the makif, in the external realm, in the macro. She was doing exactly what she was doing. She was taking care of her baby in my world, Reuven, 
Because her whole essence and reality was she was her body was taking care of Zohari in her womb. She was simply and merely taking care of her baby. In a couple hours, her water is going to break. In that moment, I realized that when a woman is pregnant, the entire term, she is a radiance of mazal. You know, this whole thing about you know, pregnant women having a, a special glow, I, I realized it as, as her partner in this world. That a pregnant woman is radiating. Literally a radiance of the mazal that is that baby. And if you pay attention to when you're with the, the, the woman in, in the presence of the baby inside, you can gain insight. Who is this person in there? Through the mother's relationship and the mazal that's being acted out almost like a script. And hence you get Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Naphtali, Yisachar, Zvulun, God, Asher, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin. Asher. And God, if I mention that. Each time that they're named, it's a mazel moment. And how fantastic is Reuven? Reuven mounts the bed? Not really, but we say he did. He merits the, the same sin as Shem. Shem gives the, the high priesthood to Abraham, but in a way that it's not easily understood. As anybody involved in the teachings, teachings of Shem will, 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 will go on to show, teaching about Shem and Shem's Torah is largely misunderstood. When you get into Shem, you will find you're misunderstood. Thus, Shem was misunderstood, and Ben Yel Ben Yel Yada, the commentary of the, of the Ben Yishchai, that was why Mashiach Ben Yosef was, was determined to die, to repair the sin of Shem who gave the priesthood to Abraham but didn't clarify exactly what kind of priest Abraham was. So they say, oh, you say Abraham was the high priest? Well, how can a high priest be married to, to Hagar? She's not fit for the priesthood. For this, Shem had a bad name for thousands of years to this day. Reuven also mounts his father's bed. Oh, what did you do that for? No one's going to write this, understand this. Now it's going to be written in the Torah in a very bad light. Then we have to go out of our way and say, well, he didn't really do it. The Talmud explains Reuven's name with all of this. Esav lost the Bechor to Yaakov and wanted to kill Yaakov. Reuven loses the Bechor because of this to Joseph, and he lives to save Joseph. To the point... That Reuven, in the future days of the Messiah, will create wars in the world called B'nai Reuven, which is basically a code red or whatever for the, the firstborns of all types, male and female, as Leah was also a female firstborn, it says, to support and make Yosef live. If Mashiach and Yosef is to die, and the rectification is this whole thing with Shem and Reuven, we say Mashiach and Yosef lives. What is Reuven's blessing? May Reuven live. Thus Reuven gives his life, not only in the days of Jacob, but in the end of days with Mashiach and Yosef to bring the redemption of Mashiach. Even though he lost the firstborn, his whole mission is Joseph lives. The secret of Joseph's living is Reuven. And it's all in his name. The Dalit in, in Judah stands for David and the fourth son, all in his name. Zvulun's name. May, may material wealth come to our house. Asher. All the women noticed me in my birth. Therefore, he has a feminine name in Asher, meaning Asher, praiseworthy. The Mazal and the names which make up the, the Kohen Gadol's breastplate. The names of the tribes are holy. They were given by prophecy. But the, the, the invoking of the prophecy is knowledge of Shem and Aver, particularly the Hebrew Ivrit. And even more particular, the, letter, the letters of the language of ancient Hebrew, not what we see all the time, but Ivrit. 
That's what goes into understanding the Torah of Moshe, understanding who these tribes were, what the Mazal was, what was the moment of every birth. Levi is, 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 is given tithe to God because Jacob said, I will give you tithing. He gives the son of Levi. Levi is carried up to heaven by the angel Michael. And he's the third son, and she says, now a man will be given to me, attached to me. What do we learn from this? Anytime you are around the support of three sons, you have the, the, the level attained of man or each to you. Torah becomes a mazal, a life teaching. You pray in the field, the field gives sustenance, says Rabbi Nachman. Have a muna, go there, be there. Really know what's happening, and it happens, because the mazal is real. One of the most fantastic things I wanted to teach. Rabbi Akiva has an, an argument in the Talmud with a Roman. Do you believe that God created the world? No. Really? So if I put a rag on the ground, I say, wow, this rag just appeared. And the Roman says, no, somebody made it. He says, you see, somebody made the world too. Now we have a mitzvah to love the gear. And loving the gear, you give them garment and bread. We say, just like Jacob only asked for garment and bread. Now, is it very loving for me to just throw you a shirt, say, okay, Garam, take your, your bagged, your shirt, and go. You have some bread, maybe some salt and water. And people say, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I gave him a dirty shirt and some bread. Yeah, this is great. Again, that's Asa's Torah. Take it literally one dimension. Don't think about it. You know, give him some stale bread. If he asks for some salt, maybe I'll think about it. But look at Jacob. Jacob didn't get a shirt from materializing like in a uh, replicator in Star Trek. God didn't just put a shirt in his way and say, Jacob, I gave you the shirt. Wear the shirt. How did Jacob get the shirt? How did he get the bread? Look at the he goat story. God imbues Jacob with wisdom. The rods, how to in, uh, affect the animals, their breeding, their colors, enterprise. How to really harness the powers of this world. Chachma or wisdom is called kolachma, the power of what or what power. Jacob got the shirt because he understood how to raise sheep, how to shear the wool, spin the wool, make the shirt, the wisdom to survive in this world. It required Kabbalistic knowledge. I guess the Ger can learn Kabbalah under those rites, no? The way of life, understanding Levant, Lubin, Torah of Shem and Aver inside. How do you get the bread? I guess you have to understand the way the world works. You want to love the Ger? Give him enterprise. Give him wisdom. Give him the Torah. Give him everything he needs to make a real impression in this world. The, the verse in Dvar says, How will the nations understand the blessing of Israel? Show them the wisdom of the Torah. And again, if we take that, if we don't even know this exists in the Torah, what Torah is that? That's just a Torah of Moses that, that tells you, throw the guy a shirt. Bring in Shem and Aver. Now there's depth, dimension, greatness, levels, understanding the matter of the matter. And it doesn't change the answer. He still got a shirt from God. But the blessing now means something. It takes shape and it takes form. Eventually the Parsha ends. Jacob makes a seal and covenant with Laban, Levan. They, they, they erect a little matseva. And as soon as it's over, the angels come. Jacob sees the, the angels. This is Torah of Mazel 101. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain this by another point. It says that the Jews are in the level called Tiferis, and the Gerim are in the level called Malchus. One is Kadosh, one is Tahor. One is pure, one is holy. 
What is pure needs to become holy. What is holy needs to become pure. The Jew needs the gear. The gear needs the Jew. We have to unite Yisod, Malchus, Teferis into one harmonious revelation of God. You have seven, I have six, thirteen. Let's join, make it six, twenty. The Gematria kept their crown. But the Zohar points out you should know that as much as this is good, the unification of two peoples, and it will happen, and that is the redemption, and that is going from judgment to mercy. When you step out and you attempt to go to the other side, a Moloch will pop up. It will. I think any Jew that's ever tried working with Garam, any Garam that's ever tried working with Jews, you rise up beyond that 7 or 613 and go to the other side for cooperation, you will meet a Moloch in your path. Whatever shape necessary it takes. The Torah teaches you life. If something happens in the Torah, you make a covenant with a bad guy. You can expect to see the Shem's divine emissaries coming your way. Whatever happens in the Torah is what happens in life. And you have to have a Muna for that. Understand that it's real and it happens. You have a name. You have a mission. There is wisdom in your name. You are a person. And you will act out part of the Torah. That also requires faith. Jacob became Jacob because there's a, there was a tradition of the Jacob program. Right? There's a Moses program, an Abraham program. The Torah is life, it is reality. Those people sanctified those levels. I am the Abraham program, or I am the Jacob program. And we today are reincarnations rolling over with this. What makes one greater than another? Well, those that aren't even aware of it are already discounted. But if you're not holding in faith, you know, I'm against my adversary and you're the Ace of Program, I'm the Jacob Program, whatever, you know, I, or the reincarnation. Reincarnation doesn't mean the literal soul. It means I am reenacting a moment in the Torah right now. When you have a Muna and faith in those moments, you actually get the spark of that Torah in you. You become it. You can become whatever your name is destined to become when you plug in the faith program. The idea is live your name. Understand your name. First, you have to have the vessels of Moshe, the Torah of Moses, in you. Understand the Torah. Understand the life cycle of Shem and Aver in you as well. And the Torah of Shem and Moses with Aver intertwined, this is a three-way a, a three braid that can never be broken. The Torah as it's written is the Torah of Moses of Sinai. The Torah of Shem is that light inside. The, the world of the Ger that no one sees. He's a convert. Until one day he becomes the Ger Tzedek. You know, this, 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 I'll, I'll end with this. I realized, do you really think when people say, you know, anger is a bad trait and it should be eradicated from the world. I really don't think that most people are holding of, you know, I'm going to kill you, as, as the anger we're talking about. That, that goes without saying you shouldn't be that guy. But anyone that's learned the Torah of Moses, even the bit we're doing now, is fiery. You know, you're in the base of Midrash, and a guy says, uh, you know who Asaph was? He was, uh, he was a reincarnation of Moses. And they say, no, he wasn't. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything, you know. And then, you know, after the class, they say, "Hey, you want to go some pizza?" And they say, yeah, that was pretty funny. What we did better, yeah, you know. So they argued it out for the, the for the sake of heaven. The chiddush is that is unacceptable in the world. And I, I actually learned this lesson in real life. This is the the lesson of ethics of the fathers. Imagine you're 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 a rabbi. And this is a half true what I'm telling you. It is true the story, but to water it down or to exaggerate the point. You're a rabbi in a training seminar for a new job. You left the base vendors, you got a job, and in the lunch break, the guy says, well, you know, uh, Moses sure didn't know what he was talking about, did he? And you say, how dare you take the honor of Moses? You can't do that. The yeshivish world exists in the world of Moses, but what happens is, for every time Shem's world of truth and of life 
shines in Moses' world to understand who was Moses, who was Asaph, who are these guys. Eventually, Moses' world must also remesh with Shem's world. Take anger. Anger is not a good trait. The, 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 the disgusting anger we understand simply, but you know what? The guy in the world that doesn't know better, don't go yelling at him like it's a base minish and you're, you're hashing it out over Chavrusa. Have Derek Eretz. Have character traits. Be refined. Always putting the Moses and the Shem and the Shem and the Moses to the point where the Arizal says they are the same soul, reincarnated. They're always going back and forth. God says, I've known you by name. I've known you by Shem. Moses says, if I found grace in your eyes. The Torah has mazal. There's understanding depths in self, without end. And the characters in the story, once we get Shem and Moshe parallel and we understand what's going on, Jacob becomes complex, but yet simple. He's deep. He's a man. He inherits Asaph's blessing. There's a lot going on. He's simple. He's Ishtam. He's a simple man. But he's incorporated an entire other person. Anybody married knows what it's like to take on another person. Jacob last week was very simple. Put on the jacket. Jacob, okay. Wow, it's the voice of Jacob with the hands of Asaph. But this week we find he stepped up. Jacob is praying. He's in the field. He is no longer static. He is contemplative, moving through contemplation, ultra dynamic. He is super Jacob. You might call him Yisrael in a matter of time. The Torah becomes dimensional. It's always the Torah of Moses. But are you aware of the light refracting and reflecting in and out of the Shem and Aver program? Understanding names. When you have the vessels of Moses in you, you understand the concepts. Then you have the Torah of Shem and Aver come to life, bringing your life to meaning and context. The basic idea, I think, is everybody wants to talk about life. Has there, have you ever had a conversation about life that you didn't enjoy? But it's very hard. Very quickly you run out of things to say. You know, we all want to be profound and have the, the, the picture on Facebook that goes viral. You know, my wisdom of the day went all around the world. This is how we make it happen. Torah, Torah of the truth, Shem and Eva, names, knowledge, wisdom. Eventually, people will start to have things to talk about. Once they have things to talk about, there's an arousal. There's growth. There's elevation. There's contemplation. There's righteousness. God's knowledge is revealed in this world. And you know what the greatest irony of ironies is? We all want to build the temple. We all want to go to yeshiva. And, but look at the opening words of the Parsha. Not even on the page. But if you look out of the box, open your mind, change perspective, you'll see Jacob was only Jacob because he just left one yeshiva and went to another. And we never saw it written in front of our eyes. It was all in, in off-the-page discussions. Such is life. We're all in the yeshiva every day. We're all living the Torah every day. Learn to, to change perspective. Talk. Understand each other. And you'll see we are all characters in the Torah, studying the Torah as it always was for all intents and purposes in the eternal houses of study of Shem and Avon. Thank you very much. Have a great week. See you on the new series that starts Wednesday, which will be the Gear Shabbat, and, uh, according to Christus 9b and the Gear Seichel. Intellect. Thank you very much. Have a great week.